First, we're going to be talking about using the equation of a line to find the slope in the y-intercept. And here to begin with, we have a line y equals 2x plus 10. And let me make it bigger. And then move over a little. There we go. Y equals 2x minus 10. Can you see my cursor? Yes, ma'am. OK, good. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, this is in slope intercept form. Which is. Y equals MX plus B. Let me make that a little smaller. OK. Where the M is the slope and the 10 is the Y intercept. So how I would write these would be M equals 2. And the Y intercept. is 0, 10. Now both of these numbers were positive, so it was a little easier to find using that um, formula, the, the slope intercept formula. But now let's look at this. We have f of x equals negative 8x minus 5. This is the equation of a line written as a function. But f of x and y are the same thing. So what this equation really says is y equals negative 8x minus 5. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah. We'll try that again. y equals mx plus b. And so here's what you do with the plus b m is going to equal negative 8 and the y intercept which is where the line crosses the y axis or any kind of graph where any kind of graph crosses the y axis is the y intercept zero comma negative five we talked yesterday about math being a code. <clears throat> Having a zero in the first position means that, that the intercept is going to be on the y-axis. You can think of that as a code too. Of course, formulas are codes, but equations are codes, especially equations of things you graph. Okay, now, here is a line, the equation of a line, but it's not in slope intercept form. We have to find the slope in the y intercept, however, so we're going to put this in y intercept form, which means we have to solve for y. So here we have 8x equals 3y plus 3, and I want to make this a little larger just to make sure you can see it. OK, I need to solve for y. Notice I have a y term over here and then plus a three. So I think the easiest way to deal with this would be to subtract three from both sides of the equation. And that would give us to begin with 8x minus 3 equals 3 minus 3 is 0, so we'll be left with 3y. Now, usually y is over on the other side, so we can reverse this. 3y equals 8x minus 3. 
And then to solve for y, to get y by itself, since 3y means 3 times y, I do the opposite of multipl multiplication, which is division. I divide by 3, and I divide by 3, and I divide by 3. So the 3's over here are 3 over 3 is 1. So this is 1y equals 8 thirds x minus 1. So this is y, 1 times y is y. This is y equals 8 thirds x minus 1. So the slope, the slope is 8 thirds and the y-intercept is zero comma negative one. All y-intercepts always have zero in the x-coordinate position, that is <clears throat> the first position, which is the x-coordinate position. Any, any discussion or questions about this? No, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Um, now we're going to do stuff that everybody loves, not. We're going to work with the uh, formula for slope, which is m equals y 2 minus y 1 over x 2 minus x 1. What that means is we have two points and we're going to find the slope of the line between them. So I'll let this be x 1, y 1 and this point be x2, y2. And then all I have to do is plug in the numbers. y2 minus y1, 8 minus 5, over x2 minus x1, which is 6 over 2. So this will give us 3, over four, so the slope is three-fourths, or three over four. Okay, now this again was easier because the numbers are all positive. Now we encounter some negative numbers. This is harder, okay? Or not harder, it's trickier. X, uh, mosquitoes. Um, X1, Y1. X2, Y2, and our formulas, M equals Y2 minus Y, 1 over X, 2 minus X, 1. And then I plug in those numbers. Let's see. I'll have negative 8 minus negative 4. Negative 8 minus parentheses negative 4. So some people just right away put parentheses around both numbers. This is whatever number y2 is, and this is whatever number y1 is y2, y1. 
the minus sign has to be there over x2 minus x1. Oops, don't write it. Okay, so let's see what that is. That's going to be x2 minus x1. So we're going to have 1 minus 9. Now at this point, you could actually get your calculator out if you wanted to. And sometimes when you're subtracting a negative number, you have to remember that negative times negative is positive. That can be tricky. So look what you can do on your calculator, just if you're not already familiar with it. There are parentheses right above the eight and the nine key. Oh, let me do this. There now. A little easier to see left parenthesis, negative down here, the negative sign is down here, the minus sign is over there, negative eight, parentheses closed, minus up here because we're subtracting, parenthesis, negative four, and let me make sure I wrote that correctly, negative eight minus negative four. OK, and I'm going to rather than putting other parentheses around that, I'm just going to find out what negative eight minus negative four is for sure. And it's negative four. The reason for that is if you were doing this by hand, let me move this over. If you were doing that by hand, you would have negative eight minus minus four, which is plus four. And then over one minus nine. Negative eight plus four is negative four, but you might not know that just off the top of your head, which is why calculators come in handy. And one minus nine is negative eight, but we're gonna let the calculator find that out for us. Okay, so now I'm going to find one minus nine. Notice I didn't have to use a negative number, just a subtraction. And that's negative eight. And now I need to find a fraction because the instructions actually tell you to answer with a fraction or with a whole number. So we're going to have negative four, negative down here, four, divided by negative eight. Now, if I hit enter, I'll get a decimal answer. But you're being asked to write a fraction. So look at this. I'm going to the math button, which is over here. Math. Frac is right up here. That will give me a fraction answer. So I hit enter, enter again, positive one half. Why is that? Because this is negative four divided by negative eight and negative divided by negative is positive. So if you're a little rusty on those rules, you can always turn to your calculator for help. But you don't have to if you don't want to. So M is going to equal one half. And that's what we're being asked to find. We're being asked to find the slope. Okay, now we get down to some word problems. But before we do that, you might be wondering, well, do I have to memorize the slope formula? Yes, it's one of those things in math that are absolutely necessary that you know. Because it actually has other meanings that we're going to get to very soon. 
So you want to be able to correlate the new meaning with the old meaning. But any other questions? OK, so using your calculator, it's going to be really, really super important. Hello there, make it brighter. Super, well, that won't help you. Super important for you to recognize that there's a negative key and a minus key, and that the minus is used for subtraction while the negative is used in front of a negative number. All calculators have some way of showing the difference between a negative number and subtraction. You just have to uh, read the instruction book or ask somebody what that difference is. Okay, now we're going to talk about slope. The slope of this treadmill. How slanted is it from the horizontal? Well, we can see that this lady, it looks like a lady, has um, shifted the treadmill up 0.7 feet, while the treadmill as a whole is two feet. So our slope is going to be, ah, here is where you have, we're going to talk about it now. We're not waiting till next week. Imagine that. Okay, let's go back up here. The equation for slope, the formula for slope, again, and I'm doing this for a reason, trust me, is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. If we were going to plot these two points, whoa, wiggly, wiggly y-axis and x-axis. Okay, one, two, one, two, three, four, five. And so there's one point. Let me erase this. I'll write it again in a minute. OK, so I need to erase that too and move it over a little bit. This is the point two five. And then this is going to be the point six eight, so I have to come out to six. That's two, three, four, five, six, and then up eight. So this is five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then we're assuming there's a line here and we're finding the slope of the line. But another way to do this, there is another way to do this, and that is to draw an invisible, but it'll be visible to you, an invisible triangle between these two points. And then we measure this height, which is going to be, see this is five. The height of this piece goes from eight to five, so this length is going to be eight minus five. And this length goes from six to two. So this length here is going to be six minus two. Eight minus five is the height of this triangle. And six minus two is the length of the base of the triangle right there. And it ends up that the slope is this length divided by 
this length. We call this the rise. And this the run. And slope equals rise over run. This is rise, this is run. So now we're actually faced with that because we don't have points on a grid. We have a treadmill that's been raised 0.7 feet. And so we have to find, since it's asking for the slope and the slope as a percent, our first step, step one, is going to be finding the rise over the run. which is going to be 0.7 feet over 2 feet. And that, thank goodness for my calculator, let me clear everything. That looks negative, doesn't it? That's not a negative, that's a point. Let's try it again. Point, okay. This is going to be point seven divided by two, enter. And I do want a decimal because I'm going to be writing a percent. I see that the decimal equivalent of that is 0.35. But that's not a percent, that's a decimal. I have to remember how to change a decimal to a percent. And here's what you do. You multiply the decimal by 100%. That gives you 0.35 or 0 0.35 times 100 with a percent sign. So you can come over here and multiply 0.35 by 100. All right, 0.35 times 100. And that gives me 35. So the grade I think it's the grade. Is that what? No, the pitch. Are they calling it the pitch or the grade? The grade of the treadmill, like the grade of a road, is given in percent. It's the slope given in a percent. It's 35%. So that's going to be step two. Step two, you turn the decimal into a percent, and then you're going to round to the nearest whole number. Or you're, or you're gonna do whatever the blue letters say. Now they know already you're gonna have a nice round number. But in the other problem like this, you're gonna have a decimal and the instructions written in blue after or below the answer box as though you can see my finger, after or below the answer box is going to tell you to round to the nearest whole number. Again, you're gonna be finding rise over run. How does that feel? Do you want to ask any questions about that? OK, now I. Feel insecure leaving you with that problem. I didn't put it on here because the two problems are actually exactly alike. First, you find the decimal, then you find the percent. By multiplying by 100. After you find the percent on the other problem, you round it.
Okay. Oh goodness, oh, there it is, whew. We're going to be finding intercepts now. It ends up that intercepts are much more important than you know. Uh, the x-intercept, for instance, has a very, very important meaning in finance and business. It's actually called the turnaround point. It can be where your profit goes from positive to negative. Positive means you've got money coming in. Negative means you've got money going out, more money than you're bringing in. So that's the point at which the change occurs. Very, very important for economies and for businesses and for your living expenses. So we have to spend time finding intercepts and that's what we're going to do now. And here's the part where we start drilling, drilling, drilling into your brain. Okay. If there are no questions, I just, I don't want to go around, you know, um, rushing you. I'm really pretty nice, all things considered. Not perfect. Not by any means. Okay. How do you find the intercepts? Here are the rules. To find the y-intercept. You let x equal zero. That's why the y-intercept always has the first number zero. Because x is zero. OK, so I come over here to this equation of a line right there, which is x plus 4y equals 8. And I let x equal zero, so we're going to have zero plus 4y equals 8. 0 plus 4y is 4y. So 4y equals 8. Now to get y by itself, I divide by 4, and I divide by 4. 4 over 4 is 1, so 1y one equals 8 divided by 4, which is 2, which means y equals 2, because 1 times y is just y. So our y-intercept, which consists of an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate, we let x equals 0 and found out that y equals 2. Our intercept is 0, 2. Now we need to find the x-intercept, okay? Let me draw a line. The x-intercept is where the graph crosses the x-axis. To find the x-intercept, you let y equal zero. Our equation, well, is x plus 4y equals 8. If I let y equal zero, I'll have x plus four times zero equals eight. Four times zero is zero. So x plus zero equals eight. And since 
x plus zero is x. x equals eight. So what does that mean? It means that my x-intercept is going to be a point that has an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate. x is going to be eight, and remember I let y equal zero. So x, x numbers, x coordinates, x points, x intercepts, I'll get it. X intercepts always have a zero in the second position. And here's the reason for that. Here's the X axis, here's the Y axis. On the Y axis, <coughs> excuse me, on the Y axis, X is always zero. On the X axis, Y is always zero. That's why. All right, let's look at what the, the idea now is that you're going to be graphing a line using the two intercepts and only the two intercepts. So our intercepts are 0, 2, and 8, 0. 0, 2, and 8, 0. Let me write them up here. Okay, 0, 2 is going to be right here at 2 on the y-axis. 8, 0, that one, is going to be at 8 on the x-axis. There you go. And now, knowing how bad I am, at graphing, that is, my lines are always wavy. I'm going to cheat a little bit and make my tablet draw the line. Okay, not perfect. But almost perfect. Well, OK, not almost perfect. But it'll do. Put arrows. <clears throat> you won't be on my math lab. You don't put the arrows. But there are arrows here to show that the line goes on forever. It'll go forever to the left and forever to the right. And while it's going to the left, it's going to be going up. Notice how it sort of goes up slowly. And as it goes to the right, it's going to be going down slowly. Anyway, this is our line with that y-intercept and this x-intercept. Discussion, just blurt it out if you have a question. Or, ooh, even better, put it in the chat. The reason for that is that sometimes when you say something, the, uh, the sound is cutting on and off, and I can't really make out what you're saying, but I can make it a habit to always go and look at the chat after our sessions and then I can email you an answer or you can be answering each other. If you can see the chat. I can't. I'm using my whole screen. So all I see is 
what I'm doing. Okay, so this is our line. Let's go to another one. We're going to find the intercepts and then graph. This Well, just like the other one, the other one was X plus four Y equals eight. I want to write this for a reason. X plus four Y equals eight. This is not a line in slope intercept form. Slope intercept form, SIF, would be y equals mx plus b, where m and b are numbers. Uh, this is called standard form. Just so you know, it's still the equation of a line. It just has a different formula. I think we talked about this yesterday, ax plus B, Y equals C. This gives us no information. Slope intercept form, you look at it, you immediately know what the slope and the Y intercept of the line is. You don't get any information from this. It's just considered well balanced. Yes, it is. But it has its uses as you will discover next week. We have to get through this week though. First week of school is always the hardest. All right, we're gonna find intercepts again. Here's a line in standard form, and we don't know what it looks like because we can't see what the slope and the y-intercept are. So I'm going to have to find the intercepts because it says to. Actually, the truth is you only need two points. But when my math lab asks for the intercepts, that means it will only consider your problem right if those are the two points you use to graph. OK, so anyway. To find the X intercept. I let y equal zero. To find the y-intercept, I let x equal zero. And that's what I'm gonna do. Um, to find the x-intercept, I let y equal zero. So I will have two x plus five times zero equals 10. And this gives me, let me move over. That, since five times zero is zero, it's gonna disappear. We'll have two X equals 10. I'll divide both sides by 2, and I'll find out that x equals, whoop, whoop, that's not right, arrow, x equals 5. So I'll come back over here, and beside my x-intercept, I will write Oh, I, I made them in reverse. Um, yes, okay, but anyway, over here, that'll be five zero is my X intercept. Now the Y intercept is what I get when I let X equal zero. Usually I do it the other way around. I find the Y intercept first and the X intercept for no reason other than it's habit, but apparently my habit is changing. 
All right, so if X is zero, I'll have two times zero plus five Y equals 10. It's ugly. All right. Equals 10. Two times zero is zero. So I'll have five Y equals 10. And then I'll divide by five and divide by five. Fives cancel, that is their one. So one times Y equals 10 divided by five, which is two. So, our y-intercept is going to be 0, 2. So we have a 0, 2 again. Well, let's just do it. Here's 0, 2. And here is 5, 0. And I'm going to do the same thing I did before. I'm going to draw a line. And we will have successfully graphed. This line. And then because it's a habit also, oops, look at that. I'll make arrows. Excuse me. I really don't need what the stars are doing right now. Go away. All right, so there we are again. We have successfully, successfully graphed another line and found the intercepts first. You want to hold on to this trick. We're going to be using it in more advanced situations. Let me look and see if somebody's waiting in the waiting room. Actually, I don't know how to check and see. So I won't, I guess. That's because I'm recording the entire screen so I would have to get rid of the entire screen. I'm really not in the mood to do that. So, one more, one more line, and then we're, we're gonna talk briefly about parallel and perpendicular. I know this is all thrilling to you, but you need to remember this stuff. You need to remember it because this week, we're gonna be, I think it's this week, maybe it's not, using parallel and perpendicular, but we will be using it during the semester. All right, f of x equals negative one, not negative one x, there's no x there. It's just f of x equals one, which is, okay, which is y equals negative one. Let's get two points, and here's how you could do it. Remember making an XY table in beginning algebra. You say to yourself, okay, if Y is negative one, nah, if Y is negative one, well, actually, all right, this is what's going on. Y can only be negative one. So if I want two points, y has to be negative one for both of those points. So I'm just gonna find some easy numbers for x's. I can do that. So maybe I'll let x equal zero and x equal two. How about that? So that the points I'm going to use the xy points are 0, negative 1 and 2, 
negative one. And we're going to plot those points and then connect them up. So zero, negative one and two, negative one. Zero, negative one is right here. This is negative one on the X axis right here. Zero, negative one is right there. And two, negative one, one, two, negative one is right here. And so I think I'll choose a blue line this time. That's a little less than perfect, isn't it? But that's okay. This is or would be, if I had made that a little better, a horizontal line. All horizontal lines look like that. They look like y equals a number, but no x. Or since y and f of x are the same thing, f of x equals a number. You know what, just in case you're interested, let me get a green line. And I'm gonna make it go vertically through x equals four. It's not asking me to do that, I just wanna show you. Okay, so this is four. That's X equals four right here. Vertical lines have the equation X equals four. They always start, well, this one for sure is that, but the form of a uh, vertical line up and down is always X equals some number. That's for vertical. Let's say vert. Okay. Those are the two weird lines. But notice they have the equation of the intercept. X equals four is the intercept of the line, the X intercept of X equals four. And Y equals negative one is the intercept of y equals negative one, the y-intercept. That's how they got their name. Okay, now we're gonna talk about parallel and perpendicular lines. First, we're gonna talk about parallel lines. So I'll show you parallel lines. They won't necessarily look like these lines. But suppose I have a line that goes like that. And suppose I have a line that goes like that. Those are parallel lines. Let me write that down. Parallel. P-A-R-A-L-L-E-L. -E -L. Parallel lines go side by side forever, and they never cross. At least not in the vicinity of the Earth. If you've ever watched one of those science programs on Discovery or on the Science Channel, then you know that Einstein says that out in space, I'm pointing out in space, out in space, parallel lines do cross. And there's a reason for that. You can take a physics class and find out. But near Earth, in the vicinity of our planet, on our planet, doggone it, parallel lines 
never cross. So there. Because they go side by side forever, they have exactly the same slope. That's important. And your book goes out of its way to say they have exactly the same slope, but different y intercepts. So we're going to prove this. If these are parallel, first we have to see are they parallel? I don't know. Let's see. Um, I'm going to solve for y in both of these cases. Here y is already solved for, so all I have to do is turn it around. y equals 2x plus 3. So if I call this line 1 and this line 2, then the slope of line 1 is 2. The y-intercept is 3. Let me write it down here. OK, the slope is 2. The y-intercept, let's just say 3 and keep it easy. 3 on the y-axis. Now I'm going to come up here. To solve for y in line 2, this is y minus 2x equals negative 4. I'm going to add 2x to both sides of this line. And that will give me, let's do this, plus 2x and plus 2x. So that negative 2x plus 2x is 0. I'm left with a y. I could say y plus 0, but it's just an extra step. y equals 2x minus Four. The slope of line two is two. They are parallel lines. The slope of line two is two. The y-intercept is negative four. Or if we want to be completely correct, zero three up here, zero negative four down here. These two lines have exactly the same slope, but different y-intercepts. Therefore, they are parallel. Parallel! That's why people ask me not to sing. Parallel, P-A-R-A-L-L-E-L. OK, we're getting on toward the end. What is this one? Perpendicular. That's a completely different ball game. OK, what is perpendicular? Well, suppose you have a line that goes like that, just like before. A line perpendicular to the green line would look like that. Sort of. It would look like that. Uh, perpendicular lines cross each other at a 90 degree angle. Let me fit in the degree sign there. These two lines, I mean, if you use your imagination, they cross each other at a 90 degree angle. Therefore, <coughs> they are perpendicular. To prove that those two lines are perpendicular, if they are, we have to find the slope of each line and then we have to multiply them together. And when we multiply them together, if we get the answer negative one, that means they're perpendicular. <coughs> so 
so let's do this. I'm going to add X to both sides of the equation. Um, and then I'll turn it around. Negative X plus X is zero. So what we'll have is 2Y equals six, so that when I divide, not so that, but it ends up that when I divide by two on both sides of the equation, oh no, Barbara, give me a break. Oxygen deprivation. I'm trying to go too fast here. Slow down. You slow down too. If you're on a test, slow down. 2y equals x plus 6. And remember that we put the x term first in y equals mx plus b. Now, what is the number in front of x? It's 1, an invisible 1. I'm going to make it visible right there. 2y equals 1 times x plus 6. Then I'll divide each number by 2, which I can do. It's the same thing as dividing the whole side by 2. And I will have 1 half x plus 3. See, I had to put the 1 there because I needed to get 1 divided by 2. It's more complicated if you say x divided by 2. Anyway, let's see. All we care about right now is the slope. The slope of line 1 is 1 half. Now let's come back over here. The slope of line 2. We've got y plus 2x equals, I'm going to put my 5 back here so that I can uh, subtract 2x and subtract 2x, and 5 was positive, so I'm going to put a plus sign in front of it, but it's too crowded together. It seemed like a good idea at the time. Now I'm going to do it the right way. Negative 2x plus 5. Much more comfortable. Well, 2x minus 2x is 0, so we'll have y equals negative 2x plus 5. So the slope of the second line is negative 2. And if I multiply those two numbers together, 1 half times negative 2. You can do it by hand the way I did it yesterday in one of my classes, or you can do it on the calculator. Why not? Um, it'll be easier if instead of 1 half times negative 2, I say negative 2 times 1 half. So I'm going to do that. Negative 2 times 1 half is 1 divided by 2. Enter. And the answer is negative 1. So let me show you, just in case you think I can't do it by hand. 1 half times negative 2 is the same thing as 1 half times negative 2 over 1. Now the reason I wrote it like that is when you're multiplying fractions, if, <clears throat> if the number down here matches the number up there, they cancel. But really what's going on is you're saying to yourself, 2 into 2 is 1, 2 into 2 is 1. So notice that you now have The two isn't there anymore. 
you have one times negative one, which is negative one, over the two is gone, one times one is one, and negative one divided by one is negative one. You could do it by hand, or you could do it with the calculator. It's a little faster with the calculator. But the slopes, the product, let's talk about this before I butt anything. Um, product means multiply. The product of two numbers is the answer you get when you multiply. So the product of the two slopes, which is what your book calls it, the book is my math lab, which is what my math lab calls it, is one half times negative two, we've already been through this, equals negative one, which means that these lines are perpendicular. Cool. That's, that's how you determine, that's one way you determine if two lines are perpendicular. There's actually another way we're gonna use more often. But this one, this one is for now. And then that's how two lines are parallel. If their slopes are the same and their y-intercepts are the same. Most of the time, it's, it, if, if it just says, if, if you notice their slopes are the same, you know they're parallel. All right, one more problem and it's a word problem. Yay! Let's make this take the whole screen. I'm going to have to read it to you. I don't know. How about reset Zoom? That's too big. All right, tech with it. A function A of S. So there's a function called A of S. The best way to do any kind of word problem is to take notes as you read. So now I know there's a function and they're calling it A of S. I don't know anything about it yet. Oh, they do tell me what A of S is. A of S equals 0.285S. They're using the letter S instead of the letter X. Plus 58. That's our function. Now it's going to tell us what it's used for. It estimates the average age of employees of a company during particular years. Well, right now, Let's just say that this is going to estimate the average age. Average age of employees. We'll take care of the years later. Now, but in a different line. Because we're taking notes. All right, so now I know that much. So I go on reading, estimate the average age of employees, yes, of a company, in the years 1981 to 2009. This is different. Okay, so I'm going to write that down because I'm a firm believer in taking notes. Years 1981 to 2009. OK, so now I've got that. Now it says let A of S be the average age of the employees. OK, so that's what this is over here. This is the app, but not the not the S. I didn't mean to point there. A of S. Is the average age.
and S, and this is very important, S is the same thing as X. S is the number of years since or after 1981. Very important, let's write that down. S is number of years since or after 1981. Now what that would mean for you is that 1982 would be year one, right? Because it's one year after 1981 and 1983 would be year two because 1983 is two years after 1981. I'll hurry up. I just saw the time. Okay, so let's just get on to what they're asking. What was the average age of employees in 2003 and 2009? Okay. Well, it, 2003 is after 1981. S means the years after. How many years after 1981? And it ends up that 2003 minus 1981 is 22. And 2009 minus 1981, 1891, I don't think so. 1981 is 28 years. So for this first answer for 2003, S is going to equal 22. And for 2009, S is going to equal 28. I only have time to do the first one, so let's do that. So A, the average age at 22 years after 1981, that's a code, remember. This means you're going to put 22 in for the S. 0 0.285 times 22 plus 58. I'm about to pull out the calculator, but before I do, read the blue words. Round to the nearest whole number as needed. And you can see that their answer is 64. Where's my calculator? There it is. So here we go. 0 0.285 times 22 plus 58, enter. I get 64.27, and they said round to the nearest whole number. So let me just make sure that you remember when it comes to decimals, the whole number part of the number of the decimal is to the left of the decimal point. This is where the whole number part is. And this is where the fraction part is. They want us to round to that. So I have to check this number. If this number is one, two, three, four, or I left off zero, and it is, then all you do is you just Dump those off, and the answer is 64. But what if? This is a what if, and this is the last thing I'll say, and you can go. 
What if this had been the answer? Then this would be the whole part. Five is not in that group of numbers. Notice I don't care about the seven at all. It's this number I'm looking at. That number is five. This is going to cause the four to go up to a five. So my answer would be 65. If that, <clears throat> if that were the right answer. But it's not, of course. It's not, of course. 64.27 is what I got. What I did get. And so all I had to do was take 27 off and our answer is 64. Now you do this one when you're doing your homework and you should know how to do all your homework problems now. But if you run into any problems, feel free to ask me, please. And remember my office hours are 5 to 7 p.m. on, um, on my Teams link, uh, my Teams office hour link, which is below, you know, on the home page of whatever, it's down below. The first page you get to in Canvas. You look down at the bottom, both of those links will be here. The link for the class and the link for the help time. OK, this is it. I'll read the chat to find out what your questions might be and answer them. And I'll find out the poor people who were left in, uh, if there are any who were left in the um, waiting room. Yelling, oh, help, help. <laughs> 